Okay, you're very welcome along to Off the Bull. We're here every week chatting about The Last Dance, streaming here in Ireland on Netflix every Monday morning. We've got Off the Ball's Ronan Mullen with us as ever. We've also got Kerry Football and Tralee basketball legend Kieran Donaghy here as well. Should also mention he is now officially a TikTok legend with his incredible white men can jump doing business online as we speak more on that later. And of course, every week as well, we've got a host of an Irishman abroad, Charlotte Regan, also host of an Irish man abroad inside basketball. Lads, you're very welcome. As I say, Kieran, we leave you off the hook on Billy Hoyle for just a moment. Uh, we'll talk about Michael Jordan and the last dance to, to start things off. Uh, what did you make of episode five and six? Yeah, I, I, I loved them. I think they were the, they were the best yet. Uh, I just love that historic Knicks and Bulls thing of 92, 93. Um, I loved them battles and, and you know, the inter- and, and getting to see so much of the relationship with Kobe. Um, and yeah, no, it was, it was, it was excellent from, it was excellent from top to bottom and, and, and the increased footage, which I think will, will get more and more as the, as the series goes on. You know, I think that's given us more of a little insight as well all the time. But I, I, I particularly loved how, how Jordan was talking about Kobe sitting down with his East all-star teammates, you know, that <laughs> Kobe is a 19, 19 year old had that kind of effect where Jordan's there. He's in Madison square garden. He's playing what he probably knows is his last all-star game. And, uh, yeah, they're all sitting talking about a 19 year old, the Laker boy or the Laker kid they were calling him that he wanted to make everything one-on-one. And I loved the way Jordan was kind of nearly saying, I hope he tries to make it one-on-one tonight. Cause I just need to show him a few things, which, which he obviously did get an MVP, but, the shape of Jordan is a huge thing I took over the last night. Like there was a few scenes where he's sitting down afterwards at 35 in the 2008 behind the scenes footage, and he's got his top on. Like and this guy retired at the end of the season. He is an incredible peak, probably peak nearly, you know, basketball wise, you know, just just beyond it, but still the best. Like he was just beyond his, I think his peak, which was, you know, if you if you if you think if he didn't take those two years out in the middle. Um, his peak would have surely been 32, 33, where, you know, when he was 32, he was playing baseball. So, um, uh, you know, I, I think that was fascinating as well. Definitely. I, I think that, uh, I'm not sure if I agree with you on it being the two best episodes so far, which we'll get to in a little while, but I definitely think the Kobe footage at the start from that All-Star game is the best behind-the-scenes footage we've got so far. And I think it just sets the tone for the two episodes, which is Michael Jordan coming to terms with being an owl lad and uh, being one of the elder statesmen of the league and getting into a position where he's going to have to hang up the basketball boots. Yeah, and the hypocrisy yeah. of uh, him saying, he's trying to make it all one-on-one. <laughs> like, so we've just watched four episodes <laughs> explaining that that's exactly what you did. I mean, I do, I do think that uh, maybe the reason why Kieran and myself enjoyed them to the level that we did is that um, that whole there's there's an emotional element to this that I think Kobe. You know, I always felt like with Kobe that it was like one of us getting to the NBA. He was a child. It was totally make a wish foundation stuff. Uh, I followed his career from the time I first heard of him as a 15 year old. Uh, I heard that there's a there's a lad scrimmaging with Philadelphia 76ers, and he's hasn't even done his junior cert. And you know that that word travelled as far as Kildare <laughs> that this prodigy was in the world. And I was like, that can't be right. That just can't, that's, that's not possible. And we debated it on team buses about how, no, nah, no, nah, that's some bullshit rumor that's doing the rounds. Uh, so when this, you know, this story plays out the way it does, and he is sent to that All-Star game, let's face it, he wasn't starting for the Lakers when he got selected to start for the All-Star team. Um, seeing him in it, it was just like, he was doing the moves that you would hope you would do. He was hot dogging the way you would if you were playing NBA Jam. You were trying to, you know, back down MJ and do the, you know, the back bend into him the way he, he had on his posters. And then the fact that Kobe is ripped away from people the way he has been, when they dedicated the episode to Kobe, I got a rush of emotion and I got goosebumps on the back of my neck at that bit. And maybe it's because I'm way too connected and I'm way too fond of it and I don't have the journalistic separation that you lads have. But for me, that was an emotional moment. I got, I got fully like, 
uh, I got overwhelmed a little bit because right. this is this is messed up. That like that 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 shouldn't happen. And the fact that they dedicated the episode to Kobe is testament of when they see this footage of the number one player in the game uh, and the number one subject in the locker room beforehand is this lad, this 19-year-old child that mm. is, you know, if George Carl had put Kobe back in for the fourth quarter, which he didn't, and Kobe held against George Carl for years to come, uh, Kobe would have won the MVP in that game, no question. Yeah, it, it's interesting actually because if you talk about what this documentary has done for Michael Jordan and for the NBA as a whole, I think it actually has had a huge impact on the understanding of the man, the understanding of the sport over the last couple of weeks. People who really knew nothing about Michael Jordan are now getting into the intricacies of Scottie Pippen and who was the best second player on the Chicago Bulls. And I, and I wonder if this is actually going to have that sort of impact on Kobe Bryant, that perhaps people, especially people here in Ireland, might not have fully appreciated just how good Kobe was when he died. And of course, it was a huge news story. And of course, basketball fans would have. But maybe it's actually seeing that moment at the start of episode five where Jordan is dealing with him and talking about him with such reverence. Well, not reverence, but a hell of a lot of respect. He, he's slagging him off. This is the sign of respect for Michael Jordan at this time. And people who perhaps aren't familiar with the story might go, all oh, right, this kid was really the heir to the throne. Mm. I, def I definitely think there's lots of that kind of stuff in, in this, in terms of nobody know, knows the origins mm. of Jordans. They're just something that's in the shop. This week on the, on the show, we got to see this fascinating footage of Michael admitting that he preferred Adidas. <laughs> And also, one of the most hilarious moments is how his mother convinced him to go and visit Nike and Nike win him over with what is essentially a kind of an office Christmas banner of the Nike family welcomes the Jordan family. I was like, what? Like, how did they win him over <laughs> with that? Like, it's obviously the money as well. But it looked so ham-fisted to see the photos of what it actually looked like when they tried to win him over from the shoe that he was adamant he was going to play in Adidas for the rest of his life. Oh, it's, remar it's like seeing at the inside of Mark Zuckerberg's a, a college dorm or something like that. But before things got good for Nike, this is how uh, how elementary they actually looked. The, the banner was incredible. And just, just the idea that your mother will be grabbing you by the arm and saying, come on, we're going to go see Nike now uh, today. Uh, it's, it's almost just like a, a hilarious image. Uh, Ronan, we might just get your overall thoughts on a uh, couple of episodes because we'll get stuck in straight away then to um, the idea of commercialism and, and Nike and, and Jordan as a brand. Yeah, I agree with the two boys. The first few minutes with the Kobe footage, I think, are the highlights of the two hours and it kind of framed the reciprocal respect between the two because the only reason Jordan's saying that stuff about the Laker kid is because he sees himself in Kobe and the whole wanting to play one-on-one -on -one and the whole thing of if he takes four shots, he's still going to want the ball and Jordan says, well, he better start effing rebounding then because he probably realised that himself <laughs> at that age that you have to win the respect of your teammates, they're not just going to keep giving you the ball. And like I watched Jordan's uh, tribute to Kobe at his memorial a couple of months ago and you could see how far that relationship developed. That was a brotherly kinship, you know, so it was quite poignant, as Charlotte said, to see his name at the start of the episode. But overall, definitely felt like there was a gear change in these two episodes where I think it owes in large part to the subject matter, which I'm sure we'll get into, especially in episode six, where they're getting into the sort of inner turmoil and angst that Jordan was going through as a figure in the limelight. Mm. And also just the mere fact that the timelines are converging a lot more. Like aside from the origins of the Air Jordan, I think these two episodes are almost entirely in the 90s. So there's not a huge difference between Jordan in his final season and Jordan closing out that first three-peat. So I think that probably yeah. was a lot. The ratio of 80s and 90s has really reduced a lot. And I think as these final episodes come out, we're going to see more and more of that 98 season and the the behind the scene footage that people are craving. It's a really good point. I, I think at times so far, you get a really good meaty piece of footage and then it's taken away from you, which obviously is really good filmmaking and it leaves you wanting more and leaves us with a lot of engine in the tank for the, the full 10 episodes. But now, as you say, it's all going to be condensed into the end of the 90s. But just on that final flashback, uh, if you want to call it that, let us talk about uh, the Air Jordans, the, the Jordan ones wearing them in the garden uh, in 98. Did, did, did that bring a tear to your eye, Charlotte? 
<laughs> I think you're overestimating how emotional I get. There's no tears, but I do remember watching that game live uh, and just like the whole cinematic element of it. I mean, it's obviously calculated enough in that I, I actually read a piece where someone suggested to Kobe that he might wear the same shoes that he scored 81 points in in his final game against Toronto. And he looked at that journalist as if to say, come on, you know that Mike wore those ones in this game specifically because they were about to re-release the ones and he could sell more of them. But there, you know, there was an element of, uh, you know, Homer pulling out the wonder bat. <laughs> he rocks up with the unlaced ones in his hand. And you just, like, I remembered at the time going, oh, shit. It's like, I'd imagine it was the same for the Knicks, that they were like, oh, we're in deep trouble here. I love hearing about the trepidation of other players when he had either had a bad night the night before or someone had said something stupid in the press. Because as we're learning throughout these episodes, developing grudges, whether they were legitimate or not, were the coal that was shoveled into the engine to make this winning occur. And I didn't shed a tear when I saw the shoes. I just It just brought back incredible memories. But I didn't realize was that his feet were actually, you know, bleeding through the socks. Like I knew that they'd be uncomfortable to wear, but like that's mad stuff. Like, surely take them off for the fourth quarter. Mm. Uh, I don't know about you, Kieran, but if that happened, even in like schools games, if your shoes were at you that much, you just get someone else to give you their shoes. <laughs> if you were in the game, you go. Well, I'm not going to wear a pair of shoes that are going to destroy my feet. I think Jordan. I think Jordan was on forty-two points. So you know, I think if the rest of us are wearing shoes that were that uncomfortable, you would be looking to take them off or get rid of them. But when you when you're up around thirty-eight and thirty-nine points, and there's a few minutes to go, I think you're going to lead them on and, and take the pain. But he got a reverse layup in that game against the Knicks with the shoes, which was just it was amazing. Yeah. It was in one of the, mon, the montages. It was uh, oh, he just this knack of getting up in the air and then this flick of his own wrist. I think to kind of control how far he could throw it, he kind of had it. He had it measured how hard to hit himself so that the ball mm-hmm. would go a certain distance. But, you know, I think a lot of people that wouldn't have seen a lot of Jordan or, you know, um, had time to see him in his prime and looking at it now are kind of going, geez, this guy was amazing. Some of the, some of the circus shots he had, some of the, some of the amazing shots that he took, um, even going back to episode three against Detroit, that one on the break against Lambeer, which is a kind of a 360 reverse layup. Um, to protect himself basically because he didn't know what Lambier was going to do. So to be coming up with that at that speed when you're dribbling down the court, um, and 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 I think it was emphasized in that in that game where he's where his feet are bleeding through the socks and he's on 42 points and he's still the man at at at, at the age profile he's at. It also I thought it was amazing at framing the significance of the shoes and him getting to say that line of look, I wouldn't have got these contracts if my game didn't speak for itself. Yeah. Like, you can talk about yeah. the shoes all you like, but none of this happens if I'm averaging two rebounds, two points. Uh, taking us back to 1984 and the signing of that deal, uh, getting to watch Larry Bird rap, truly one of the funnier moments of the series so far. <laughs> it also threw up uh, another one of my favorite fashion moments. Just a just a tiny cutaway to a child looking through a link fence wearing the thriller jacket. <laughs> you can pause it. I don't have the time code. But like that to me was the standout fashion moment from this episode. Uh, better than uh, Tony Kukoc's Jordan tracksuit. <laughs> that the actual thriller jacket being worn by a random punter. Highlight of the series so far for me. Uh, for me, it's uh, the newscaster or whoever was doing the report describing the shoes as as hot as a cabbage patch doll right now, which is quite assimilate. Like, what, what, what was yeah, yeah, it? Yeah. Were they that hot? Like, were Converse, like, were, for you guys, were, were, were Converse ever the thing? Like, did you ever look back and say, never. Oh, you know, never, like, I was thinking. Never, never. Amazing. Never, never, the, never the thing. I, my, my first big pair of boots were Nike Air Hatchies, a, a yellow, a white, and kind of black pair, and they were just like, I remember my my mom said the year before she got two pairs of boots and uh, she never asked us. She got two pairs of basketball boots for me and my brother. And uh, 
when I opened the box and he opened the box, she said I could tell straight away that, that I wanted my brother's boots, like that I was kind of, <laughs> you know, salivating over these boots, like and my own were opened. And yeah, they were grand, but like Jesus Connors were unbelievable, like, you know, and she, she, never felt, <laughs> she, never felt, she never felt so sorry for someone that day that like I had the wrong boots. So the following year, the following year, she made me kind of put down on my list you know what type of boots I wanted and I saw them on, on, a, on a slam magazine or something uh, and, and, and I got them and they were my boots but never cons no even though I love the ad the old ad with, with Johnson and, and, and Larry Bird is, is, is a classic where they, they actually went from hate kind of not hating each other but having a dislike to, towards each other um, and then a day shooting above in Larry's house and magic and they become kind of best friends for the rest of their careers mm. uh, off the back of it even though they were right in competition but they got to understand each other and what made each other tick but uh yeah no it was it was it was unbelievable uh yeah he, and and like who got fired from adidas yeah well that's the question i was just like, about to like, say like, that who's like, the guy who got fired like, who, who got, got fired, fired is the question somebody's, got hard, getting, somebody's getting fired quick. oh my god that well, was they, a... they they took sonny vicario who is the one who said put all your chips on mike and uh, they were he was the one that ultimately got hired by adidas because adidas realized we messed we messed up there mm. and he was the one who said you need to put all your chips on Kobe so it's funny yeah. that that mirroring of history but you're so right Kieran cons if you okay admittedly if you showed up in a pair of Larry Johnson's cons those were the only cons those or the Kevin Johnson cons they were the only ones that could be accepted but as Nas put it best they were a lightsaber the, the understanding <laughs> was if you had these shoes, you could play better. That was the trick of the marketing. The you know the whole idea that the league banned them uh, suggested that they were giving you an unfair advantage. And you know, like Kieran, you know better than anyone, it is a mind game. And if you believed you could play better in the shoes, sure, that was half the battle. Yeah, Jeez, these these Larry Johnson converse. I'm just, I'm just after googling them here. Oh my god! Yeah, they were trucks. <laughs> That's <laughs> why I wheeled these out today because I bought these retros a while back, and these were the Reebok Omni <laughs> pumps. I mean, lads, they weigh like a bag of sugar. <laughs> they make no sense whatsoever in the context of what you're actually being asked to do in the sport. But yeah, the LJs were. They were atrocious looking yokes, but they were the only acceptable cons, yeah. Uh, do we have any other fashion takeaways from the two episodes? Like, I, I certainly wanted to just give quick tribute to Michael Jordan's get up just when he's walking around the streets in Barcelona in 1992. Amazing shorts and t shirt combination. And uh, also his Augusta sweater vest, casually wearing that while uh, yeah. I was on, on the, the, the fairways playing golf before, during, during NBA finals and stuff like that. That, that is the ultimate mic drop. When, when Michael Jordan. Uh, sidles up on the tee it's already a scary enough experience especially if he wants to bet like 10 grand on it but then he like puts on the Augusta sweater vest 10 grand I need business <laughs> 10 grand a hole on yeah, <laughs> yeah I thought Seinfeld's by... shoulder pads were the other uh, fashion takeaway there's uh, there's a there's actually that's actually a lovely bit with Seinfeld taking the piss out of Phil's blackboard with all the mm. plays on it uh, but yeah those shoulder pads were NFL level shoulder pads so that was my other fashion takeaway. What about you, Kieran? Any anything else before we get off the the catwalk here and move on to some other talking points? No, I like like Kukoc's tracksuit is probably the coolest tracksuit I've seen so far in the whole show. Uh, people might laugh at that, but I think that's the coolest shit of all time. Oh. Like, especially if you're mm-hmm. going to be Tony Kukoc and you're going like back then that tracksuit is fire. You know, yeah. you might look at it now and it's a bit baggy or whatever, but no, he's also, it's gorgeous. He's also, it's it's <laughs> class, like. <laughs> an absolute top tracksuit. Uh, you know, That's... I was online last. I was online this morning after watching, kind of like googling up some more Jordan stuff. Basically, I'm off. Like, I, I, as if I don't have enough Jordan stuff, I'm off trying to look the, for more. That market's going to skyrocket now. Like, yeah, it, 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 big time. You, you can't go into a shop at the moment, so everybody's shopping online anyway. So the world is your oyster. Like, what mm. are you googling right now after watching the last dance? If you've got any bit of nostalgia and any bit of a fashion sense, you're looking for Air Jordans, right? Well, the last time we were on here, uh, Kieran made a point to take the piss out of BJ Armstrong's shirt, which I think I had in my head <laughs> a different shirt. But I went back and looked at the actual shirt, and you were right. Pure geek, like absolutely horrendous, and not even from a different time. He's wearing this in the present day, a horrid shirt. But I thought BJ Armstrong had 
the best quote of the two episodes. And that was where they flash back to 92, 93. And he points out that this is when I realized he's not actually just better at basketball than us. He's doing something else because he has figured out how to win Mm. no matter what the circumstances. I thought that was like, that was chills in the back of the neck for me. And just really true. Like just really true. He could manipulate the energy of the game whichever way he wanted. He had mastered the skills to the point of genius. Uh, so now he was actually, they were dribbling the ball around and he was doing something else. Mm. It, it also strikes me as well that a surefire way to completely piss Michael Jordan off is just to compare him to anybody. Like maybe if you compare mm. him to Magic in 91, it would have been an acceptable thing to do. But you don't go comparing him to Clyde Drexler, for example. That's, Me being that's, compared to him, I took offence to, to that, he says. Yeah, but that's the thing about the Air Jordans even, and they've been given only a fraction of the, the timeline so far, which is fair enough. This is a basketball documentary, but like, the percentage of Michael Jordan's fortune is owed in large part to what he's done with Nike. And if he had joined Converse or Adidas, he's just another, you know, another block in the wall. Whereas the Air Jordans gave him this license to be mm. individualistic, they referenced it in the thing. Nike was like a tennis player's a brand. So Michael Jordan wanted to go out in his own. He wanted to be seen as one of a kind. And as you said, to be compared to anyone, even Drexler was a pretty good player. Uh, he saw this as the ultimate you know, slap in the face. So um, I think the Air Jordan thing, played, it was obviously re- hugely beneficial for him, but Nike probably couldn't believe their luck either. Yeah, absolutely. There were, it was kind of a two-way street to that, making him the, the Arthur Ashe and, uh, of basketball at that point, I think is, is how they put it. Um, we should talk about the, the dream team. Um, and you mentioned Tony Kukoc there, and we do guess, I, mean, I was waiting for this all, all season long, we, we do guess uh, the, the pure, unbridled, violent joy of uh, Scotty Pippen and Michael Jordan going after him in two separate games. And I think Kukoc comes out of it pretty well. Uh, I think Jerry Krause comes out of it pretty well. Uh, the krause meter ticking in his favour again this week, uh, in my opinion. Yeah. Um, what, let, let's just talk firstly, though, about Isaiah Thomas. Uh, like We have uh, archive footage here of Jordan saying, no, Isaiah Thomas... Uh, stuff but in the new interviews he does come out and actually addresses it he says no matter how much I hate him I would still have him as the number two point guard ever and he says that he would have made a difference in a negative way no matter what way he spin it it was nice that he gave him that I felt it was nice that he gave him that kind of Mm -hmm. uh, because we were saying on last week's show how good Isaiah was it's kind of you don't get that from 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 being a uh, a viewer if you you didn't know the backstory Mm -hmm. but it was nice for him to say that but like yeah look you know I think the biggest thing is and I think this is where it was always pointed at Jordan, and it obviously wasn't all Jordan. This was nobody wanted him on the team. You know, that was that was the end of it, really. Like, you know, and I think Jordan saying that he would have had a bad effect on the morale. And as you watch through the Olympics, uh, you see how their morale builds and builds to where they're kind of an unbreakable bunch by the end of it, and they have anybody who can step up and up and win a game. And and of the whole trip, you know, with the gold medal games and the basketball and the practices, the best thing that Jordan said about the Olympic experience was the bonding with the with the other players and and you know almost that friends for life and and what happens when you go away with a team for six or seven weeks uh, and you're with each other all the time and you're spending so much time with each other you don't normally do that they they do that as an all star weekend where they show up and they might have a night out and they say yeah 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 but this is actually you get to know about the guy's family you're in the room with you're talking to them all the time. Uh, you're having coffees, your dinners, lunches, trainings, um, playing cards till five o'clock in the morning with Michael Jordan, which is obviously a horror show because <laughs> I love the way that Barkley was talking about that he was going to be shoving you all in pretty quickly. If you want to have a good hand to go against him with, with, with the way he bet when they were playing cards together. So, yeah, look, it was, you know, the Olympics showed as well, I think, that I think Magic... Magic still, Magic had, had, had five championships. He, you know, he was coming towards the end of his career. But I think going into the Olympics, he found that this is a chance because he didn't really play that much in that season. He found this is a chance to kind of let Jordan know that he was still, you know, the top dog. And, and I love the way that kind of goes from that's the way Magic started to think that at the end of the Olympics, like, you know, yeah. even that famous game, which was the greatest game of all time, supposedly, where the Monte two Carlo. the two, yeah, the two teams played each other. And, you know, Christian Leitner didn't see the floor. And, <laughs> You know, Barkley and Magic are going at Jordan hard, like, and then they just realise, look, this this guy is 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 on another level. And I think they they get into a quite bus afterwards, and uh, Magic said to Larry something like, you know, we shouldn't have pissed him off, we shouldn't mm. have pissed him off, and that was the kind of that was the sign over for Magic. Even though Jordan, if you think of it at this stage in '92, Jordan 
has two championships. That's that's what he has. He's scoring titles and he's MVPs and he's dunk championships and all that, but he still only has two titles at this stage. But you can very quickly see Magic realizing that there's a lot more in the tank for this fella and that he is of a different breed. And just the fact that the way they talk about him being non human, playing the 36 holes of golf, playing cards till five o'clock in the morning, mm-hmm. going to train and has eleven loads of energy at training. You know, he 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 was he was truly his burn and his desire for a competitive edge, which we'll probably get to when he talks about the gambling later on. You know, it's 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 ever evident in anything he does. That goes back to the Nike. It goes back to him covering the Reebok logo. He wanted Nike to be the best because he was Nike. So he was going to make sure everything was done that Nike would want. And he knew that the Jordan brand was linked was going to be linked in with the with the with the. The Jordan brand was going to be linked in with Nike, and like you know, that's a that's and as he said, everybody online shopping now. That's you know, that brand again is off through the roof, like you know. So he, he wanted to be the best at everything he did, whether it was cards, golf, <laughs> tiddlywinks, the coin tossing stuff with the boys in the Bull Stadium. Yeah. Like you know, he's that was betting twenty dollars. He's betting twenty dollars with guys who are you know getting one hundred and fifty dollars to be there for the night, like you know. Yeah. And he's making their night by them beating them. They're going home telling everybody I beat Jordan, but you can just tell that. That uh, the competitive burning desire in him, which which really in the Olympics you see it, you see it visibly out in the court. You see how how good he is and how better he is than everybody else. Just on, on the Olympics, uh, I am calling bullshit on the idea that this was anybody but Michael Jordan who had anything to do with this. Hundred, I'm so glad you said it. Like you, because you to... Kieran, everything you've said there, it ties in completely with he look. In The Sopranos, Tony Soprano never orders a killing. But he says to the people closest to him, this is who I would kill. That's totally <laughs> yeah. what happened here. Mike would talk to a mad Rashad and whoever his buddies were and let the message go out that I won't play on this team if this fella's in the same locker room as me. And everything else we've learned in terms of the grudges and the fire that those fed... This, this bullshit that he's feeding us of. Uh, I never, oh no, I never had Jesus Christ. I never mentioned Isaiah Thomas to anybody. Great this guy. guy in the face of point guard. I think he's great. I mean, it, uh, it doesn't, it doesn't make any sense, and it's really obvious. And in some ways, it's kind of funny. You got to laugh at it in some but, way. But would you yeah. say, Jared? Would you say if Isaiah was, say, Isaiah is a different character? And he is a, still has a falling out with Jordan, but that he's a super nice guy the rest of his career and he's a really nice guy and Magic wants him on the team and Larry wants him on the team and all the guys. You can be damn sure there would have been a Tony O'Donoghue, Roy Keane situation where they would have got the two of them to sit down and say, okay, Mike, we know you don't. We know you hate Isaiah because he walked off. Isaiah says, sorry, you're obviously the second best point guard in the league at the moment. You should be on this team and we need to make this work. This is USA. We're going to go out and do it together. No. Well, I think... Yeah, it, Jordan, I think... Yeah, Jordan made it obvious. He probably didn't want him but there was nobody mm. screaming for him. And I think I, I think it's wrong to solely point out Jordan. I think if, in, if if they all wanted him, they would have they would have found a way to make it work or they would have at least made an effort. Whereas uh, as, as of now, it was just kind of I know you're right. You're right in essence, of course. Um, but uh yeah, he was But you think because nobody else was going, hold on a minute, where's Isaiah Thomas? But in the same way, I think the Roy Keane analogy is good because the whole team did want Roy. But then there was a part of the team that was like, oh, geez, it's great not to have that in the room anymore. Uh, but I think that uh, they they weren't in the same position. Like, but, let's face it. But also, they, like, this, this was, uh, planets were about to align in terms of articulating to the world exactly how big this man was. And sometimes everyone's a little bit behind in catching on to that notion. And the whole dream team experience was everyone, the world, Magic, Larry, and the NBA catching on to this isn't just the best player in the NBA. This is the most influential and most popular sports person on the planet. But the notion that Isaiah Thomas's inclusion would have in any way derailed the dream team is totally nonsensical. This was not a competition. <laughs> this, this was a coronation for the dream team. This was all, all this was was... These are the best American players. Let's honor them, give them a gold medal, and basically put American basketball back on the map. We're tired of being embarrassed by these other countries. So Isaiah Thomas wouldn't have affected. They would have walked the gold medal anyway. This was like the Monstars in Space Jam rocking up to the Olympics <laughs> and trashing the place. So I think yeah. it's just unfair. Isaiah deserved 
that uh, commemoration as much as anybody. It's not as if... Fuck Isaiah Thomas. No. <laughs> no <laughs> way. You see, Magic, like, Magic comes across as this affable guy, and he is, but like he, he, the famous example when he clobbered Isaiah coming down the lane in the finals, and then in this footage alone where he's you know, jabbing at Michael Jordan in the practice game. So like, it's not as if he's all had a competitive streak. Larry Bird was in bar fights. He walked off the court went with the Pistons. Like these were not perfect people. They don't even. They're making Isaiah Thomas to be some scoundrel. Yeah, but and I, also yeah. just just on the, the the Roy Keane analogy, it, I, I think it's a little bit different because in that you have a manager versus a player, and in this it was very much the head coach on side. And I was just going back to your dream team this morning. Um, on page eighty two, it, it goes through the fact that Rod Thorne was obviously involved with the Bulls, had to, to get yeah. Jordan on board for the dream team. And Jordan said to Rod Thorne, Rod, I don't want to play if Isaiah Thomas is on the team. Now, no one on the, this is just to, to quote Jack McCallum in the book, no one on the committee had to communicate that to Chuck Daly because Daly knew it himself. As Jordan had told the coach in an early phone call, I don't want to play if Isaiah Thomas is on the team. And Chuck let it be known that he would not fight for Isaiah, which I think is, is a <laughs> big cutting and a fairly ruthless from Chuck Daly. But the head yeah, coach, his head coach. Yeah, the, yeah. the coach is on Jordan's side here, so there's actually not that much of an important friction w- w- when it comes to, say, what might have happened with Roy Keane, for example. I, I, I tell you, any fellow that brushes his hair as much as Chuck Daly did, <laughs> you'd be damn sure he wanted to be the coach of the dream team. And if it meant leaving <laughs> Isaiah Thomas on his ass back in Detroit, it was going to be done. <laughs> Chuck Daly wanted to be over in Barcelona, coming back there, looking suave. He played golf with Michael Jordan every day. How do you think Isaiah felt about it? So maybe a oh, better wow. analogy is is the uh, international rules team, Kieran. That uh, let's say Mick <laughs> O'Dwyer is coaching the international rules team, and Charlie Redmond says, "I will not have Nooks or Buckley on this team." <laughs> Mick O'Dwyer saying, "Well, I won't fight for him." I mean, that is a that is a nice wrinkle there. That even you, you, Chuck you, Daly Chuck knew, Chuck, wasn't yeah, a big fan. Chuck knew the piston, you know. Chuck knew the 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 hit bad boys era team was gone as well. So he was he was probably thinking next level again. And what else? What what, what what's out what's here next? for me? If I if, yeah, what's next? If I'm a part of this team, he knew what the team was going to be. He knew when all the names started coming together, he was going to be like, "This is going to be unbelievable. I want to be a part one, of this, no matter one, what." One little detail on the uh, on the dream team, which I am fully obsessed with. I just find the dream team story that Monte Carlo practice, just the fact that you lined up the Beatles of basketball, managed to convince them all to play together, uh, got the results they did in the fashion they did, and changed the face of sports the way they did, uh, and introduced the world to this joy that we are all experiencing now. Um, is There's another game that isn't mentioned in this, and that is where the college players took on the dream team. And it's in a documentary, and it's mentioned in the book, uh, where they took the best college players, including Chris Webber and Grant Hill at the time, and brought them in to prove to the Dream Team that you could be beaten. And they did. They, sure. The Dream Team actually lost one game to this team of college players. And if people want to hunt out that book that you just mentioned, that's, that's the one there. Jack McCallum's book, Dream Team. It is an unbelievable read and just explains that game and how it came about that they actually, the dream team did lose a game. I mean, that, but that's it, an, what, I love that wrinkle as well. Wasn't there, what, there, was, there was genius in, in, in Chuck Daly in that last, that, like, that's the story about that. Not that the college team beat them. Yeah, that's the big story. But it's the actual story behind the scene of Chuck Daly, you know, not putting Jordan in enough, not playing him enough, not playing gammy rotations. New fellas were in mm-hmm. trouble, left them out there. He wanted them to lose. I think they played them the next day and beat them beat him so bad I think certain fellas might have quit after it I think they about, you know if this is what the NBA is about I don't want anything to do with it um, and uh, yeah I think that was I think that was the I, but genius by genius by Chuck Daly to have him mm. like he told he told nobody don't mention the scoreline the scoreline was taken down off the wall nobody wanted to see it but when the reporters came in and started interviewing after the game they lost they were like they knew there was tension uh, between Something the dream happened, team yeah. and Something happened, but like unbelievable by Chuck Daly and uh, a great coach uh, maneuver to to maybe put into your bag if you're if you're a coach up and coming out there <laughs> and you have a team that gets ahead of themselves and you and you play a game and, and you purposely try and uh, 
uh, inflict a bit of realization on your players that you know you're going to have to work harder if you want to achieve the ultimate goal. And uh, I think Chuck Daly needed needed to bring them down to earth because it's 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 quite conceivable that they could have gone out there and just got caught by a Croatia or a Spain mm. because they just weren't ready. It, that's not you know out of the realms of possibility. But what you had coming to the end of the Olympics was a team that you know it had eleven Hall of Famers on it. You know you can't you just can't. Uh, you can't even put they were it never losing, with that yeah. team. They were never, they were never losing. But yeah. uh, I think, I think that. I but, think the, but that said, that Kieran, made sure that, the, that Croatia team was strong, and I thought they handled yes. it really well in just showing that, like, of all the players we're seeing in all of this, Tony Kukoc is the player in his prime. If he's playing in this NBA, he's a killer. Like mm. he is the, he's the prototype Kevin Durant, yeah. floor spacer. Handle the ball at six foot eleven. Shoot the drive shot. left-handed. He's like, he's the dream. <laughs> I just yeah, he, he, he so would be perfect. Funny, you know. It was so funny when he goes, "I do not even know them." <laughs> I don't know. I don't know why I found <laughs> that. Like that was the funniest bit for me. I watched it with my son this morning. We both lay back on the couch laughing because they gave him like. Like the, it was an absolute nightmare for the lad. What they did to him in that first game, I thought that was beautifully covered. What did you think? I, I, I think when you, I think when you Scotty Anya for a predominant period of time with his length, and when he takes a break, that Michael Jordan picks you up and starts getting at you worse. So I, I, you know, you can see why he threw in the towel pretty quickly in that first game. Well, Michael Wilbon says that they were out of line, which again is bullshit. Like, come yeah, on, it's, you're, you're double teaming their best player. He, he's a bull. He's a bull, he's just talking on a bull's front there. I would say. Yeah, but Scotty coming out and saying his future teammate isn't good enough to play in the NBA is a that bit. was that was hilarious. <laughs> Maybe <laughs> chill, let's chill there, Scotty. You know, but yeah. like, and it shows you how much they hated Jerry Cross even in '93. Like, yeah, this guy was. We see, we're talking about a lot of the '98 hatred. Like, you can tell how this thing, how how Phil Jackson and kept his team from exploding on this guy or how vice versa or how that didn't explode earlier. I think Phil Jackson did a huge part to play. Uh, you know, a bar probably the last year where he just wasn't even in conversation with Jerry Cross. But, you know, he was still the guy who stood up to Pippen in the bus to, to quiet him down. But Jerry Cross, uh yeah, he's 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 a big he's he's a winner so far, but it's yeah. going to turn bad from in the end, but he's a very much yeah, a winner so far. I did think that two organizations when he started saying, this is a great organization that's winning these. I mean, that was, <laughs> oh, I mean, so that, they basically had that clip. Mm. That if, <sighs> if there was one thing that's circling these lads' heads, it's that Jerry Krause saying, first and foremost, this is a great organization. I mean, that is to an extent like Muhammad Ali's manager saying, look, this fight was won by the corner men as well. Mm. You know, you're dealing with a genius, a sporting genius. Credit where credit's due. You're dealing with two. Like, I still think Scotty is is an underrated genius uh, in all of this. And um, I don't think he'll ever get his due. But, like, the whole Ku coach thing is brought about by that little round man <laughs> disrespecting <laughs> these two people. So Tony really bore the brunt of uh, that hatred. Well, like Jordan is saying in this, that he's willing to put someone in front of his actual kids when it comes to uh, approaching Ku coach, which is bollocks. Like, first of all, you're, you're not his actual kids. You are his uh, associates in a business here, which is predicated on winning games. Like, Kraus believed that signing Ku coach would give them the best opportunity to win championships or a better opportunity to win championships. More championships. He was right. More yeah. championships. He was, that right. Is his, he was, he was right. right. He, like, I mean, like we did, we did the classic game club there uh, before this and like we, we spoke about the 97 finals when Ku coach was amazing. Well, like not just about three threes and uh, that crucial game four, for example. This was a, an important part of the jigsaw for the Bulls. Kraus was doing his job. Like you, you, you've got to admire him for that. Like again, as you say, Kieran, Kraus is going to get slaughtered before this thing is out. He already got slaughtered in the yeah. last couple of episodes, but he's had a good two weeks here. And really in the mid-90s, you kind of have to, to doff your cap to what he was doing because it took balls to actually go out there and knowingly try and get Kukoc with the information that Jordan and Pippen will be unbelievably pissed off at him. They're calling him, like they're giving him slurs to his face about his height, uh, like the, the whole uh, smoking jibe during this episode when uh, Jordan offers him a cigar and is like, actually, no, smoking stunts growth, Jerry, uh, and then uh, pulls the cigar away. Like they're horrible to his face. So for Jerry Krause to still be going out there as GM and doing these, uh, pulling off these moves, like approaching someone like Tony Kukoc, 
I think you just have to commend the guy. Yeah, and this is nineteen. Still, this is give, nineteen. Give Scotty his contract. Well, well yeah, there, yeah. There, there, there is that. Just, um, there was just the fact that it was, you know, there was Europeans in the league at that time, but it was still very much on kind of chartered waters, really, and 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 was, you know, can these European fellas stick with the with the game over here? And obviously, we know today like that some of the best players are from overseas, but uh, that. That cool coach, you know, for Kroos to to seek out this guy in the troubles that were going on there at the time, and 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 realize and go to games or get footage of games or whatever way he did it, but to realize that this guy was going to be the future and he was a huge part of the second three peat. So it's uh, it, it goes full circle in the end. But yeah, you can certainly see at the time that Scotty and Mike, you know, are kind of going, yeah, this guy might be the shit out here, but you know, this is the NBA and. You know, this is how we play defense. And, you know, cool coaches, when you're the best player and you can't get your hands in the ball, the rest of the team starts struggling because they're, they're out of sync. They're used to their best player getting touches, making things happen, making things happen for others. And here they are, a powerhouse like Croatia, get, getting beaten the way they, they were because um, that Yugoslavia team the, the, the few years previous was just unbelievable altogether. Absolutely. Um, the other thing that we should uh, talk about is how uh, Michael Jordan and his relationship with gambling has been dealt with over the last couple of episodes. Uh, Ronan, what, what did you think of this in terms of how the documentary makers dealt with it? Uh, how big or how much, I guess, was Michael Jordan actually cut down in the media from, from your point of view when it came to these stories about him being in an Atlantic City casino or actually the, the big sums of money he was gambling on the golf course? Yeah, I'm kind of a little bit conflicted. Like, I, I'm a big fan of American life, but I do think their, like, moral, or moral compass, rather, is a bit skewed on certain things, like this total anti-gambling thing. Like, I'm not a gambler by any means, but I think in the context of what other players have done in the 80s and 70s in baseball, for example, like, you, you can Google the stories. I don't need to go into them here, but, like, that Michael Jordan, it, like, they're not comparable in any way, but the OJ case kind of sparked something in American culture, I think, where just this insatiable need to, to see what people are doing when they're not on the court or playing their game. Like Michael Jordan, we're all, people love building people up and then tearing them down. And I thought that this was just a way of doing that with him. And I don't know, I don't know what you, got, you guys think about that, but I just thought they had to find I something. I disagree. Out. That book that came out, it, like even the author himself said he was surprised by how much it, it blew up. Because it wasn't the done thing at the time. Now, fast forward to cancel culture in 2020, and it very much is the done thing. And I think Jordan almost had a Barbara Streisand effect on it, where by refusing to talk to the media about it, he almost drew more attention to it. And it was just such a, a conflicting thing for me. I wasn't sure what side I fell down on, to be honest. Charles, what, what did you think? See, I, I, I disagree. Um, and even though I like I come from a gambling background and horse racing is, you know, my family's business for many years, I think that the the issue here wasn't uh, an obsession with what people do when they're away from the game. I think that this was connected to the social justice issue. I think that those presenting both of those together was important because not only are you not going to wade in as the most powerful person in sports, uh, but you are going to gamble amounts of money that could feed an awful lot of people in poverty-stricken areas. Uh, there's, there's a morality in that. There is a turning of a blind eye on both, on both issues. I thought uh, fair dues to Mike for allowing Obama to express his disappointment with him during this period. Because let's not forget, and it's come up in the media this week, that uh, the independence of this documentary has to be questioned because mm. Mike has his hands on the reins. He did allow uh, maybe the most beloved president of all time to express how disappointed he was that he didn't speak up especially in that election race uh, and that comment of even Republicans buy shoes, uh, how, how much that affected the, the black community and how much of an opportunity lost it was. The gambling mm. thing really, like, I don't, I think Mike still doesn't get it. I still think that there's an element of Tiger Woods in this. Tiger felt he should be allowed 
do these things because of how difficult his life was and because of all the sacrifices he'd made. Mike felt, I should be allowed to gamble this money that I've earned. And yeah, there's something in that. There's a point there. Mm. But the difference is that you're choosing uh, to... It'd be, I think people would have been okay with it if he was doing an awful lot of social justice work and very politically active and, God, he, he is giving all of this money back and I'm sure he did like there was reference to an awful lot of the charity work that he did unbeknownst to the media but the optics the optics of blowing half a million on a round of golf when your uh, people of your demographic are struggling in the way they are the optics of charging what he did for the sneakers that he sold it just it ultimately the point that was being made there I think we're going to see part of the reason he left the game. I'm, oh, oh, and just the like the Jesse Helms thing. Like, yeah, he was a reprehensible character. There's no getting away from that. But should sports people be prescribed role model status? Mm-hmm. Like, it shouldn't be a mandated thing. I don't think you don't no. have to just because you're an unbelievable sports person doesn't but mean. He's, but he's, but he's not a sports person. No, he's but like there the comes Muhammad a point Ali, when he's not a sports person. Yeah, but the Muhammad like, Ali they, comparison is a fair one because they're they're on a similar Mount Rushmore, so to speak. But Muhammad Ali was a villain anyway. He like he had nothing to lose at that in that time of his life. He was he saw the begrudgery against his success. Was like, well, sure, I have nothing to lose. So he went to bat for his community and deserves untold respect for that. But Michael Jordan, quite the opposite. He was one of the first successful Black African Americans, walking a very fine line. Like he had to be very prim and proper to make his money. It wasn't as if he was following the footsteps of somebody else. He was very much an originator. And I think it's very easy ret- retrospectively to look back and say he should have done this, he should have done that. But he was like, you have to look after yourself at a certain point, and it's not nobody's perfect. Well, that and is the what, thing. That what, is what, what he did. He did look after himself. I and, don't, you know, the conversation I had with Roland Lazenby, the author of that book uh, that I mentioned, Michael Jordan: The Life. Conversation I had with him last week was exactly what you were saying, Roman. That we don't know the North Carolina that he grew up in. We don't know. How, how racist that area was, how lynchings were a thing, and how much black people from that community were raised to believe that we can aspire mm. to success in business. And that is drilled into him from a young age, whether it's uh, directly or uh, it goes in by osmosis. But what uh, I struggled with here was, I had had that conversation with Roland Lazenby last week, but I didn't know that his mother had actually approached him yeah. to make a statement. That was interesting. Helms. And he had turned his back on, you know, his chief advisor and not, said, I don't know the man, but I'll make a donation. I mean, like you say, he, he did he did prioritize himself. 100%. It's... Uh... Was it? I think there's actually a line in it where he says, "Was that selfish? Was my behaviour selfish at the time?" And he says, but "Probably." He like, said, "He said he never thought of himself as, as an activist." Yes, like, it's how, an exact how, same yeah. quote. How many people? How many people do think of themselves as activists? Like this man's a professional sports person at the top of his field. He doesn't have time to be going out, you know, putting out fires on a social sphere all the he time. Never thought of himself as a shoe salesman either. I oh mean, well, I think he did a, to a certain extent. There's a few semantics that, you know, he uses and I get thrown around in terms of his interviews that are, you know, Mike, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Uh, I doubt anybody ever puts that to him. I'm not addicted to gambling. I'm addicted to competition. Mm. Mike, come He's on. He's got a competitive problem. That's, that's, yeah. like, that, that's, that's a, another quote from this as well. Like, I think that when I'm watching this and I'm listening to Michael Jordan describing himself as selfish when he describes himself, when he says, maybe I'm not the person you should be following. There's definitely part of me that wants to give him a free pass at that point. That is like, okay, well, at least you realize the role that you possibly could have played, but because of the selfish streak, you realize you are not going to play it. However, do you automatically reach a point where that free pass is no longer acceptable? I'm not sure. Like, maybe Michael Jordan actually didn't have a lot to contribute at that point. We hear about the, the private uh, financial contribution he gave to Gantt at that point going up against Jesse Helms. And that is how he felt he could have made the biggest contribution. Maybe he felt being on the pulpit a la Muhammad Ali was not the way for Michael Jordan to make a difference. I he, did, he, that did, is... he, he, he didn't want to, like, it's, it's, it, I think it's pretty, this whole 
Republican by sneakers too was a kind of a comment he made in the back of the bus to the boys as well. He said, like, you know, I think he said, I'm a basketball player. You know, he no, he never thought of himself as an activist. He didn't want to do it. I've had people approach me, oh, will you, will you run for this party? Will you do this for this party? Will you join this fellow? Will you give him... It's, it's, if, you, if you've no real interest in it, and I don't think Jordan had, you just don't want to do it, you know? And I've said no to, I've said no to that loads of times because it's just, I, I just don't have any real interest in it and I, and I don't want to well, be a part on. of it. Hold on, hold the phone, Kieran. Hold the phone. Yeah. Let's say Kerry people are being discriminated against, and some would say they are already, but let's say they're being discriminated against and living in poverty for the most part and the rest of the country demonizes them. Uh, and you are among the most wealthy Kerry men in the country. Yeah. Do you step back and go, well, you know what? My number one thing's football. Well, like, like I, I think he, pu- he, I, he pumped money into him, whatever, whatever. I don't know how, what the amount was, but he sent a donation, which I'm sure was generous enough because he knew he wasn't going to do the other thing, which, which they wanted him to do was to come out and kind of speak out for him and, and, and give him a foot up in this, in, in this race. And uh, I, 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 I know you're, you're making a good point, Jarlick, but, the, you know, there's a point to me then that's saying that he just didn't have any interest in it. He didn't want to do it. And every spare minute of time that he wasn't working on his craft of basketball, that he wasn't doing a commercial or that he wasn't being hounded for autographs left, right and centre, I think Jordan's piece was... You know, and I think you know this goes back to the gambling and the golf course. I think Jordan, I think Jordan's love of golf, to be honest, is be by himself for ten hours and be able to have the competition, to be able to have the fun, the the, the crack, the cigars, and not have any of the bullshit that constantly followed him around for every period. Like I thought, the intro to to, to episode six, the fame, the pressure, the before, yeah. the after the game. I always knew that he was mega famous, but I think that was the first glimpse that I ever saw where I'm saying. This this is why this fella quit. Like this is a hundred percent why this fella stepped away from the game. Like he just fucking he just didn't want to do it anymore. He didn't want all that came with all that anymore. The constant constant hounding. Like you know, the game against Atlanta where there's sixty five thousand people in to see him. Like they're in to see Jordan. Yeah, they're in to see the Bulls. They're in to see Jordan is is is, is the main ticket. Is the main ticket. And he's home. trapped. Yeah. And he's he's trapped. And I I had I had Dave Hopla who worked with Jordan, uh, he's the best shooting coach, one of the best shooting coaches in the world. He's, his records, I don't know if you've ever seen him, Jalap, but his records are absolutely amazing and what, what he's able to do. And to see him do it, uh, he did a live sh- thing in the complex for all the kids in Chile. He shot 283 shots, he made 277. He missed six what? shots. Like, and these are, these are three-pointers and you know everything is from the free throw out and it's, it's, it is all straight on. But like, just to see a guy make that many shots is amazing. And he said he used to be with Jordan at camps in Berlin, in Germany. And he, he's sponsored by Jordan. He's got all the Jordan gear. And he said he was sitting inside in the restaurant and Jordan came in by himself with about six security guards. And he went up to a spot in the restaurant and he sat down and he ate by himself. And Dave Hopla, I remember Dave Hopla looking up. Dave Hopla was with a few people having great crack wine, best of laugh. And he said he walked out of the restaurant that night and he felt sorry for Michael Jordan that, that that's Jordan sitting by himself in a restaurant getting his food in because he needs that. He needs six security standing there so nobody comes up and asks him for photos or autographs. And, and, and I think 1993, as much as that, se- as that episode went on last night, I was kind of like going, Jesus, he actually, he actually did need a break. I was all, you know, there was loads of theories of why he left and, and, and what the reasons were. But he's, he's, to me, he looked completely, completely burnt out. He's lying back and he's having a cigar and he's got the glass of wine and he's kind of going, you know, this is, uh, I, I'm about ready right now. You know, it, it, you know I'm yeah, about ready right now. Yeah. yeah, I won't miss it. Like, you know, and, and I think I, that was sad. That was a sad bit for me because, you know, obviously the, the year and a half away re, re-energized the appetite for it again. But right then and there, he knew he was the best. He knew they were the best. And, oh, can I do another year of this? And the answer was, was obviously no. But I just thought that was a fascinating intro to, to yeah. episode six. I definitely underestimated how much that public profile played into his decision to step away. Like I knew it was in the background, but in episode six, it's framed very much in the foreground. And as Kieran said, that opening line where he's reciting the commercial, you know, spiel and the tedium of that, just repeating it over and over again, almost summed it up perfectly. Like this is what he was going through. This was his day to day. And we saw um, clips of him hanging out with the security team at the, at the stadium. And 
that was his normal life apparently like uh, mm. a lot of the uncut footage that isn't used in this documentary is just reams and reams of him walking around with these security guys because they're the only people that he could hang around with and he's in his own little dressing room there that's the yeah. other thing that i i was like i heard bill simmons talk about this that he couldn't get changed in the normal dressing room area because of the hassle that came with that mm. so to like you know we all know what it's like the crack is in the dressing room yeah uh, but he didn't even have that. Yeah. But it's not it's not even as if he he couldn't go to the bar, he couldn't go to nightclubs. Like even the fact that going to casinos and going to the high rolling tables, like those exclusive pain sort of tables, meant that he had to only be with a certain amount of people. And similarly on a golf course, playing thirty six holes a day, like you're in in one way you're limited to a certain amount of people. So I think those two reasons, the reason those were so uh, much hobbies for him, was the exclusivity and just being able to step away from the limelight. I just want to come back to the uh, social justice question just for one last point. I know we've all had uh, our say on it. And I think it's very interesting, the, the conversation that's come up here about whether or not you reach a point in your athletic fame that it becomes unavoidable for you to not speak out on certain issues. Some people will say, regardless of the size of your platform, if you have a platform, you should be using it for good, a la Colin Kaepernick. Now, what we can say for sure is that addressing these issues was not to the forefront of the mind of Jason Hare or the people involved in creating The Last Dance. Because if it was, they would 100% have sat down with Craig Hodges for a conversation about what happened in the 1990s. It is the single biggest omission from the entire 10 episodes of The Last Dance. It's for me the biggest flaw with the 10 episodes because I want, really, really wanted to see the subject covered well. Um, like uh, we, 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 I think we've had Hodges on the show actually a couple of years ago, and I, I, like he, he talks about being run out of the league after uh, the, the 1992 championship. I think it is they, they, they end up in the White House, and he shows up in a dashiki. He's written a, a letter to George Bush uh, expressing his discontent with the, the treatment of minorities about the invasion of Iraq. It's quite controversial. We don't know if George Bush ever read the letter. He probably didn't. Says Craig Hodges. But what we do know after that point is that Hodges uh, files a lawsuit about being blackballed. From the league. This is the, the early 1990s at this point. He, he talks about the NBA's lack of black owners at this point. He speaks out about racism within the NBA and, and uh, across America. But crucially, he also has a go and criticizes Jordan for failing to address the, I guess, judicial injustice around the United States in, in the wake of the Rodney King um, controversy. So th this is also a huge part of what happens in the early 90s in the league. That There is allegedly a conversation between Craig Hodges and Magic and Jordan during this time where he asks the two boys, can we actually boycott the league for a while? And the two lads are like, no, 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 that's way too controversial at this point. Craig Hodges is on the record in the past, and now we see this in the documentary about uh, Jordan not showing up to the White House in 92. Hodges is on the record in the past as uh, Jordan saying, fuck Bush, I didn't vote for him. Like, that is a crucial omission from the documentary if Jordan has actually said that as one of the reasons why he doesn't show up. Like in the documentary, they say he was playing golf or something. Now, I accept that this is only one man's word, but for me, he is worth a conversation. Like you go through the, the book Long Shot, uh, which was released in 2017, um, and he makes the, or he puts forward the theory, and I'm not sure if I agree with this, but Hodges' theory is that he is one of the few who can stand up to Jordan because of his education and the edge that gave him. He said that Jordan had no education and no education in the struggle of their people in North Carolina. I'm not sure if I agree with that personally, but Hodges uh, has said that. And it's June 1991, he makes that point. Uh, about um, magic and uh, about Jordan not going with uh, a boycott. And then the, the final point I just want to make from this, just going back through my notes from uh, 2017, uh, in his absorbing book, uh, Hodges stresses how he tried repeatedly to persuade Jordan to break with Nike and go into the sneaker business for himself with the aim of creating jobs in the black communities. Jordan argued he was not in a position to take control while he was tainted by allegedly saying Republicans buy sneakers too. This is, this is all creating a, a fascinating picture about what the factors were in Michael Jordan and his lack of a stance on political issues. And Craig Hodges might have been wrong, he might have been right, who knows? I just would have loved to have seen Jason Hare sit, sit down with him and actually get his view of the story. A teammate of Michael Jordan's, an important teammate, got blackballed from the NBA. That is an important piece of information. I think it's a whole new documentary though, isn't it? And it really does connect up the dots of how uh, carefully crafted this is and how you know Michael's hand in it uh, would have nixed that as an idea.
right out the mm. gate. Well, that is exactly it. I think we know the answer to why this is included because it is a Michael Jordan documentary. Like, I'm not sure does that, does that taint things for you or not? Like, as, as I say, when it comes to the actual political question of Michael Jordan, part of me was definitely feeling, I can see why people give him a free pass on this when we hear his side of things. Uh, I guess you have to question, why am I so easily giving him a free pass on this? It is because of the one-sided nature of the picture we are being given in The Last Dance. Like it's, well, it's, I think part of it is, you know, in, contained in the title. It, this is The Last Dance. This isn't worth and all. We're watching the dance to a large extent. Uh, it's not... Uh, it's not as grimy and as gritty as we'd hope. You you know for a fact that he's drawn a red line through a lot of footage that would be even more eye-opening. As I pointed out last week on this very podcast, uh, what we see in a lot of lads smoking cigars and playing golf and getting off planes, I mean, you hung around the team for the full year with these cameras. You tell me they only came out then? I mean, it is... It is definitely still under the banner of NBA entertainment. Yeah. And, you know, Jason Hare is a good director and The Fab Five is a great documentary. But I bet even with that, there's aspects of that that he he couldn't lift the lid on fully. I would say, I would say, well, we certainly went into this with our eyes wide open. I didn't think this was going to be some groundbreaking journalistic mm. enterprise. Like either this was going to get made under Jordan's auspices or it wasn't going to get made at all and in that circumstance I'm going to want to see the documentary so I think we're going to get we are getting nuggets out of it that we probably didn't anticipate and Jordan himself said people mightn't be overly impressed with him by the time this is all said and done even the I did think the Obama comments were noteworthy he could easily sure. have, he could easily have nixed them yeah and I, I wouldn't be surprised if, if Jason Hare interviewed some of these people and brought it to Jordan and Jordan was like nah but like he did leave some stuff in there that he could quite easily have taken out. And yeah, again, there have been articles in the last week. People are quite disappointed that it probably isn't getting into the, the grimier stuff. But, you know, I think people kind of knew it. They should have known what they were getting when Jordan signed off on this doc, you know. For sure. Yeah, I, I can't argue with that. I, I think that uh, I, I'm not surprised. And like, I think it's it's just a criticism of one thread that we were all looking forward to seeing how well they would address it. It's, it's almost this intangible thing in the story of Michael Jordan now that uh, I guess, are we almost playing, uh, are, are we kind of guilty of the same thing that the media in the United States were in the 90s? That what, what is the most negative thing yes. that you can pick out at this point <laughs> and uh, dig, dig down into it? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, we are, we are, we are, we are. Stop but, thinking, enjoy the documentary. Well, yeah, yeah there is there's definitely an element of it. Like, I mean, I, I, I'm on a, se- on a separate level entirely, 100%. Uh, it, it's an enjoyable thing. But I, I definitely think we should be asking questions about no, the point you're making, the points you're making are, are The points you're making are valid, but I think this documentary is trying to get uh, 14 years of Jordan's career in along with Phil Jackson, Rodman, Steve Kerr, Scotty Pippen, all these other big characters uh, weave in footage that they have from a full season, which is, if you if you do that for a full season, you would have loads of stuff anyway, never mind trying to get in the history of what got us to 98, which is what the mm. producer is doing in this. So, you know, uh, I would say there's probably, you're thinking of the the few bad things that missed the cut I bet you there's still a lot of good stuff that didn't make the cut either just because it still is only 10 hours you know it still is only 10 hours really like you know and there's a whole lot of storytelling in this as well as obviously the way he's trying to mix it in going forward and back which is that's why he's doing that he's telling the backstory with original footage then he's throwing in a bit of 98 stuff so uh, uh, you know I think there's a lot of stuff that, that we'll say when this is all over that they could have touched more on or they didn't touch at all both good and bad uh, we might just uh, wrap up with a few final thoughts. Uh, my final thoughts on uh, the last couple of episodes is that Michael Jordan's actually quite old school in uh, the way that he's thinking. I know we're getting this from a 1998 perspective and him being, as I said at the start, one of the owl lads. But like that uh, footage of him uh, in the dressing room asking for cigarettes with Scotty Pippen, obviously, in jest, having a can mm-hmm. of beer and kind of pointing to the fact that modern coaches wouldn't allow you to do certain things is quite interesting that the, a young coach would, be, uh, would have us practicing today, he says, when he's getting into the golf cart. Uh, on the on the golf course and stuff. I, I just don't think we uh, quite appreciate just kind of the, the sensibilities that he had that weren't exactly of the new I, uber professional NBA era. What about what, what about what about getting out of the the stadium with, with uh, Scotty and getting into the bus and 
It's all good. Like there was nothing, there was nothing going to stop him getting these three thirty tea times so he could have a beer. Get into the golf it was car. the blowing of the horn. It was the beating yeah. of the horn that took the yeah. biscuit there. Incessant. Like, like, I was, was all incessant. on board with, come on. Like, we've all had to try and get someone. If if you've ever tried to leave a party with someone who insists on saying goodbye to everybody, we understood the frustration of trying to get Scotty not to talk to the press. But the, nobody gets into their car outside the house and starts beeping the horn. But that's exactly what he did. That was a beautiful. Well, if, if you have a tea, if you have a tea time, Jarlett, you might have to do. You might have to go to them kind of places, like you know, it's rude and bad etiquette to be late in the golf course. I well know it. Flying out lastminute.com trying to get to my tea time in Chile. So it's uh, it's 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 golf etiquette to be on time, and you could tell nothing was going to stop him. Getting Scotty, so, out. Like, even Scotty, Scotty, kind of laughing, kind of going, "Hey guys, sorry, I can't talk to you, but might need to go." Like you know, so like you, Scotty you wants to talk. At the top, the, you, you league golf course is where you touched the hand of Michael Jordan, correct? Yes. <laughs> Do you I want to tell that yeah. story? Because I don't think you've told that story before. Ah, uh, but uh, he, he, we, yeah, we were, we were in school, and uh, I don't know how we were in school, like. I don't know. I, 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 we were in school. I don't know how we heard. We were sitting there and something got to me. Michael Jordan's out in Barrow Golf Course. Somebody's dad told somebody, told a teacher or told somebody or whatever, but it got around the school anyway. So uh, I immediately just put my hand up and, uh, and said I had to go to the toilet, like, you know, whatever, and uh, just walked out. You know, literally no on hearing it, you stopped and said, on, 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 <laughs> Excuse on, me. On, on hearing it, on hearing it, I was gone. I was on my bike and uh, with a buddy of mine and out we cycled at 10 or 12 kilometers out to the Chile golf course. We weren't members of the golf course. So it's, you know, it was kind of, you know, members only kind of signs and the gates and that kind of stuff or whatever. Obviously, probably a road jar coming or whatever. So you can creep down by the breach, by the beach and kind of climb up on the rocks and then get up onto around the, the third tee box is where I, or the second tee box, I think, was where I, where, was where I saw him. And I was just, you know, taking a back at the size of him and I don't know if you've ever played three golf club but the second is a par five by the ocean you know like you hit it out straight and then it's kind of dog dig right but they were giving Jordan the line because he was obviously a baseball player so he could hit the shit out of it so <laughs> I remember the, I remember the caddy who was actually a guy who I went on and worked with in the Greyhound Bar uh, who I was working with in the Greyhound Bar but a year later was a guy called Donny Hoolan who's, who's dead now God rest him but Donny was was telling Mike and out over the out over there, like you know, out over the line of the of, of the hump, like which is way off line. But like obviously, if you can hit it 350 yards or meters, that's the line to take on. And he just he smoked this thing, like you know. And I remember he I, he used them words after he hit it, he's like, oh, I smoked that one. And he just started walking back. And I just remember seeing this golf ball travel, and I never saw a golf ball travel this far before. And I was kind of like, going, how is the ball still going? And yeah, we just. We just followed him around. Far, wait, how far away were you from him at this point? And are you, as I picture you, in a bush? Yes, looking yes, over? exactly, exactly. That's exactly how I am. And at one stage, I was probably about 15 feet from him. And uh, I just couldn't believe the size of him. And he was black, like, you know, the way he's kind of, you know, he was jet black. Like, I was like, oh, this guy looks the coolest guy I've ever seen in my life. He had a big goal diamond earring in he had a cigar out he was just he was just on on, on kind of uh, and like Tralee is such a good golf course then he's probably there kind of going like this place is unbelievable um, and yeah we I followed him around for the 18 holes and uh, uh, as he was passing by the bus he made a glom for the sleeve of his jacket as he was going into the bus and took pictures of him going into the bus and I remember we got our bikes thrown into a fella's boot who drove us in to town afterwards and as Jordan bus was passing my mother's house, I took a picture of Jordan right outside my house. And oh, for like class. three or four, for about three or four years after that, like I used to come out and I'd be shooting out the back, and then I'd walk out the driveway and I'd see the main road, and I'd be like, "He's Jordan passed. He looked in here at this house. Like he could have seen my ring." Do you know what I mean? So it was, uh, um, yeah. But like that was, you know, uh, I'd say coming over to Ireland. The same was it? Might have been what later than that. Yeah, I was. Might no. I I'd say I was fourteen. I'd say it might have been ninety eight, ninety nine. I'd say. Right. Right. So your house could make a, a an appearance in the last dance. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, if they follow the road to the golf club, anyway, there'll be there'll be a few sightings of me, like a, 
a, a US Marine commando looking in over 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 <laughs> grass bushes and stuff. Rehearsing uh, lines yeah, from White Man Can't Jump. <laughs> yeah, yeah. T- tell us, tell us about that, Kieran. Does uh, is this the start of a new TikTok career that's going to take you to the next level? No, I, I'm not a big big fan of TikTok, but I saw a guy doing a movie scene uh, on it like recently, about a week ago. Uh, so I was bored uh, yesterday, and I downloaded it yesterday morning. I was up early with the kids, and you know, got them to breakfast, and they were watching uh, Peter Rabbit or something like that for like two tw- two twenty minute episodes. So I was like, okay, it's forty minutes to do something. So. <laughs> I was uh, downloading it and trying to figure it out and trying to learn how to work it. I wouldn't be technically great that way. So, uh, yeah, then they came across the white man can't jump and I was like, yeah, that's, this is kind of perfect. I know the, a white man can't jump, jump. I could sit down and I'd, I'd recite the whole movie for you, every line by every <laughs> single character. I watched it so much when I was young. Um, so, um, yeah, I, I, I'd even get the Jeopardy questions right if I watched uh, White Man Can't Jump because <laughs> I, I, I know the answers. The, so, the best uh, scene, best scene in White Man Can't Jump has to be the fella uh, Raymond holding up the shop with the gun to get money yeah. to play Give the money. <laughs> Give you all your money. <laughs> Raymond, Raymond, is that you? Raymond. <laughs> Not man, <same> Raymond. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, all time. Uh, That's another podcast altogether, lads. Top ten oh, basketball uh, movies. Absolutely. Um, like so, I, I was. Well, we're going to have lo- we're going to have loads of time. Let's not be too much life sport. <laughs> <Sorry. laughs> yeah. The the time you got a shot is uh, was off to a tee in the video. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that was the hardest part. Some yeah. people might say with my shooting ability of making shot <laughs> making the shot was the hardest part, but it wasn't. Uh, <laughs> It was to get the timing right of it, of it hitting the ring. But uh, yeah, no, I, I, I'd say I did about seven or eight takes, I'd say. Um, That's not bad. So yeah, I, I, yeah I, I knew the word. So it was just about getting the timings right and the turns and the actions to try and make it look that it was actually going on as well as well, having the crack with that. So <laughs> yeah, it was good fun. It's got, it's got big, it's got big, uh, it's got big love online. So look, once people are happy, once we can keep people smiling during this, uh, this COVID-19 is no harm. That's it. Well, I for one welcome our new TikTok overlords here on Off The Bull. Uh, <laughs> listen, Charles, Ronan, Kieran, thanks a million for hopping on this week and uh, hopefully some more good stuff next week from the last Can time. I Can I say one thing first? Yeah, go one, for it. Just before we finish, uh, Jerry Krause, again, I think massive gains yes. made on in the episode by building up Dan Marley to Jordan yeah. that he's a great defensive player. I think it was a master stroke. <laughs> I think he knew what he was doing all the time telling Jordan Dan Marley's a great defensive player. They knew they were going to face the Suns at some stage. Yeah. Phoenix were, were in the Western Conference Finals in the ni- early 90s a few times. They were a common team. They got Barkley. Everybody knew they were going to be there. Jerry Krause, Master Stroke, telling them, telling Jordan that Dan Marley is the best thing to slice pan. And then Jordan goes out and burns them for 55. <laughs> also, how four. many... If I could say one thing. Smoking cigars. Like... What? You're a professional athlete. You can't be smoking. Well, you see, you don't. You, I, I, the, the, you don't inhale cigars. Is, is, is the technique? I think, Charlotte. But I'll tell you a very funny one before we go. We <laughs> were in the Bahamas on a Kerry team holiday, and we were after winning the All Ireland or whatever, and we were out and we were in this kind of uh, Bahama kind of sh- a place where it was like it was like little shanty sheds, but every one of them was a family's bar, and it was like 20, and the goal was that we'd have a drink in every one of the bars, and we'd do loads of tips and keep all the locals happy. It was a real local spot. But we bought four cigars in the first place. We were in big, massive cigars, and we gave them out, me, Michal Cork, Seamus Scanlon, somebody else, but we were smoking cigars, and we having the crack. And uh, by the time we got to about 17 or 18 pub fellas were fairly well on it now and it was it was trying to hold bodies up and keep everything going in the one motion up the up the kind of town or the village or whatever. And uh I met Seamus Scanlon outside the pub and he was he was smoking the butt of the of the <laughs> of the cigar and he was taking the biggest inhales ever and he'd suck it right down into the lungs and then he'd blow it out and he turned over to me and he goes, Star, there's fear smoking in these cigars <laughs> <laughs> I go, Scan, you're not supposed to inhale them. Ah, oh, fuck it. Yeah. Jesus, my chest is burning. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, cigars, um, cigars, I, I don't know. They did smoke a lot of them. I don't know. They're obviously not inhaling them. I don't know how bad that is for you, but certainly cigars are a, a very cool thing back in the day. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, and just quickly, quickly, while the lads mentioned yeah. the Suns finals. So, uh, like, obviously... Charles Barkley, a bit of a hidden MVP in these two episodes. I thought he was pretty funny yes. in his limited screen time. 
at Barclay Unbelievable. And he tells a great story about Chuck Daly coming over to him in Dream Team practices. And Barclay top scored for the Dream Team in 92. Mm. And uh, he came over to him and said, Chuck, you're the second best player I've ever seen. And at this, at this point, Barclay thought he was the best player ever. And he said, who's the best? And he pointed at Jordan. And he never bought it. Bar- Barclay never bought it until those finals when the Bulls eventually overcame the Suns. But Kieran, I just want to get your technical breakdown, please. That Paxson shot that wins the series, right? Why, yeah. did, why did Grant not just lay that ball up? Do you not have a clear run? I don't think... They were down two, so he, yeah, he, the, the, layup ties it, the layup ties it, but I don't think he's at a great angle. I think he's very... I think he's very side on the basket. I don't think he's an angle to go off the glass. And when he gets it and turns... Also, Pax is wide open. But is that yeah, but a... there's guys like Jordan's after driving down the lane, so I'm sure there's bodies coming down the lane. So when he grabs that, just gets his bearings, I'd say you can see pressure coming from this side, and he just turns and kicks it out. Triangle, and angle, baby. And also... Yeah, like, I think... But like, just uh, from it the is outside, a good it lo- point, though, Ron. It looks, it looks like a higher percentage shot, though, just the way it played out. But also, Danny Ainge, why does he not run out and try and block the shot? Paxton gets a clear shot. Like. Can't get there. Can't I, I get there in time. He, did, he didn't even try. I he didn't even try. I know try. you can't get there. I, I always have this talk. Put your hand up. Team. Yeah, I always talk about this with our team that, you know, if you're in some kind of defense and you're caught or something happens and the ball is kicked to somebody, never just stand there and look oh. at them because that's just the easier shot. Even if you're never going to get there and you make a charge running low at his midriff while he's jumping, you might get in his eye line, you might put him off a bit. And I always tell fellas to scramble to a guy if he's open on the three-point line, never just stand there. Because I think to stand in there with a shooter, any bit of a decent shooter, like you see these guys in the NBA these days that shooting in a, in, in, in a warm-up, they're, 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 they don't miss in a warm-up. Like these, and, and the average of three-point shooters are sitting out there in a warm-up wide open and they do not miss a three. Hmm. So uh, yeah, think, One thing you know, to pull Paxton up for next week is, is the number of three-point shots that are taken today versus oh, reckless. Ah, ridiculous. Time. It is horrendous. Yeah, so I think in that Suns, I think the Suns were this great three-point shooting team. Like Marley had three and I think they only had one in the second half of, 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 of game four. I think they had six in the, in the triple overtime game. You know, and this is with Thunder Dan who were all built up like he was Steph Curry at the mm. time. You know, mm. we love Thunder Dan Marley, a white guy out there shooting trees and he was brilliant. Uh, but like, you know, there's no comparison and, and that's the bothering thing about the whole comparisons about Jordan versus if he was playing no and we said it already, if Jordan totally was playing no, he'd be, he'd, yeah, he'd be one of the best three-point shooters in the league and he'd also be unstoppable mid-range and he's unstoppable going to the basket. If he got his three patting it down with his defensive abilities, he's still the best player in the league right now if he was in his, anywhere near his prime. It's like he's better than all of them. Yeah, it's very I, true. I just thought it was interesting. Paxton himself says here, I wasn't supposed to get the ball in that place. So I presume it actually was supposed to be Grant to just go in and lay No, that ball. it wasn't supposed to be Grant Ronan. It was supposed to be Jordan, but he went down and he got quadruple team. So he's only, he, that play is drawn for Jordan. It's not drawn for Horace Grant. Michael didn't come out of the timeout going, okay, Horace, you can here. <laughs> no, it's funny because uh, with the Steve Kerr one in, in is it 97? When uh, uh, like yeah. that was yeah. drawn up in the timeout, where it's like, right, Steve, you're getting the ball. Whereas Paxson was probably the most surprised player on the court to be getting. Fair, Paxson was 91. No, as well. no, no, no. You've got that all fucked up. It was meant to be Jordan taking the Kerr shot. Kerr made a yeah, joke about the fact that it that it went to him. Mike said to him in the timeout, "Be ready." Yeah, that's all that happened there. Because about 91, say that Ainge didn't make a run at him because he knew we're fucked. Pax got the ball. He doesn't miss these. And you know, there's that moment of absolute. You still, you still got to run though. In that kind, in that kind of a game, Jarlett, there's no excuse for not somebody no making excuse. a charge. It's, it's life so or death. To me, there's no excuse for missing foul shots in the NBA. To me, I find the foul shot percentages, particularly at that time, like I remember my own percentages foul shots are hard, no, were foul better shots are hard. than some of the NBA players. And I know they're more tired playing any two game season, <laughs> but really. It's a fucking free go at the basket. It's not. It's I not. Mean, There's fuck all free about it. You're standing there by yourself. Everybody's staring at you. You have to try and make the yeah. that you should make. It's like the yeah, five foot should. putt, Jarlett, and you don't have you don't have a thousand people standing around the green in every five foot putt you take. <laughs> and I tell you, if you Still, take your percentages, percentages should, should be, be higher. Lower. Even yeah, even then, the percent <laughs> the percentages should have been higher. And Shaq was a fucking disgrace. <laughs> he, he was chucking the ball with one hand. Will you stop? 
<laughs> uh, J- Jarlis Regan officially better than John Stockton in uh, 1997 exactly. for example thank you um, lads uh, if, that, if that's everything we're going to wrap it up uh, but as good I say stuff. more good stuff uh, for The Last Dance coming your way next week what are we into episode 7 and 8 so yeah. the penultimate potentially penultimate we might do a bit more after uh, Octopole coming your way next Tuesday as ever make sure to tweet the lads if you've got any shouts any opinions on the last couple of episodes of The Last Dance